would like to introduce our guest speaker. Dr. Stephen M. Bradley is currently the chair of the Department of African American Studies and professor at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. Dr. Bradley received his PhD in 20th century U.S. history with an emphasis on the black experience from the University of Missouri, Columbia. An educator at heart, Dr. Bradley's life and mission Dr. Bradley's life ambition is to personally teach, mentor, and inspire the young people who change the world for the better. Dr. Bradley is also a prolific scholar and researcher with numerous publications, including his newest book, Abending the Ivory Tower, Civil Rights, Black Power, and the Ivy League, which, which recently won the History of Education Society's Outstanding Book Award, as well as the Anna Julia Cooper and C.L.R. James Book Award from the National Council of Black Studies. Go, brother. His other book, Harlem versus Columbia University, Black Student Power in the Late 1960s, is the winner of the Phyllis Wheatley Book Prize. And his book, Alpha Phi Alpha, A Legacy of Greatness, The Demands of Transcendence, is a favorite by the men who have set their sights on Alpha Land. Some of his accolades include the Don Brennan Humanitarian Award, the Better Family Life Excellence in Educational Leadership Award, and the St. Louis University Faculty Excellence Award. Generous with his time, Dr. Bradley frequently volunteers in the community. In the wake of the tragic events in Ferguson and St. Louis, he engaged in discussions with representatives from the U.S. Department of Justice, Civil Rights Commission, and the Department of Education. As a voice from the community, Dr. Bradley has has appeared on BET, MSNBC, CNN, BBC, Al Jazeera, and in the New York Times. So please help me welcome Mr. Excuse me, Dr. Stephen Bradley. Let me say this: there was a mistake made, uh, and. I shouldn't have come up after this brother. Like, uh, I'm supposed to come up. I should. Have, I should have came up before you and and went and sat down or ran away uh, while you come up here. So thank you so much, brother, for your words. Thank you. Uh, before I speak, I'm going to ask the permission of the elders uh, to share words. Do I have the permission, please? Thank you. I say. <clears throat> First, give an honor to God, and then to his angel, Makiba Foster, <laughs> who, who, as you know, is the, the fearless and fresh new leader of Arlick, uh, who is the, let's see, do we say regional manager? Do we say director? What do we say? We say all of that? We say queen boss lady? Is that what we say? <laughs> That's all right. That's right. And so she is, uh, she is everything. I've been knowing um, Sister Foster uh, since St. Louis, uh, and uh, yeah, a good while, a decade or so, and she was doing good work back there. She uh, did the work that doesn't come with thunderclaps. That is, she protected our history. She protected our culture. And this is some of the most important thing you can do because long after we're gone will be the work that she did. And so uh, I'm so proud to know her. She went up to the big city. Uh, she's from Alabama, is that right? Went up to the big city, to New York City, to the Schomburg Center to, to do her thing up there. And then came back to the dirty, dirty. Came back to the dirty south. Like uh, she's our Zora Neale Hurston, right? Is that right? Right, so, no, I appreciate her because what Arlick is doing, I'm in love with. In this day where people are propagating uh, fake news, in this day when there's heightened racism, we need somebody to tell the truth, and that's what you dwell in, that's what you operate with. I'm a member of a, of a fraternity uh, I don't want you to think that I'm a member of the fraternity that's behind me. I'm a member of a fraternity um, called Alpha Phi Alpha. Uh, you see it when you, you walk in, it's the first thing you see, which makes sense. And so, <laughs> I apologize. 
guys. I'm playing. I'm playing. But I am in a fraternity, Alpha Phi Alpha, where we believe in the idea that we must transcend all. We must transcend all. All of the, the foolish isms and schisms, mm -hmm. all of the, 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 the hatred. And we transcend all of that, all of that to become better people, to become better humans. And so, if you're with me on that idea, can you clap once? Now let us know. Boy, look, doing too much. Doing too much. I like that. That's the spirit. But we do have to remember this is the African American uh, 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 Research Library and uh, Culture Center. So if you're with me on that one, clap once. Now we got on beat. Okay, he was saying the upbeats and the downbeats. Look, we finally got it. We finally got it. Let me give a big shout real quick uh, to, to my, my, my brother uh, and my best good buddy, uh, Terrence Farmer, who is easily, easily one of the top three smartest people I've ever met in my whole life. Easily. Um, he's uh, now down here a resident of Fort Lauderdale. Uh, and I want you to get to know him. Um, uh, he parties like a rock star, and so you should hang out with him sometime. But uh, more than that, he's a man for the people. Has been since his Alabama State days uh, as a, a hornet. What do they? What do they? Yeah, as a, as a hornet. And so uh, we spent a lot of good time in Columbia, Missouri, together. And so uh, he's been very kind to me. And finally, let me thank. I don't know who these people are that would come out on a Thursday night to hear an egghead speak. Who are these people that would come out on a, on, a, on a work night knowing they had to get up and go to work the next day? Who are these kinds of people? <laughs> Those are my kind of people. I just want to tell you that I love you. The people that are interested in black history and culture at all times, every day of the week, every month of the year, are my kind of people. So I love you and I thank you for being here. Thank you so much. So what I intend to do tonight is to share a little bit uh, from my most recent book, Up in the Ivory Tower, Civil Rights, Black Power, and Ivy League, uh, and then uh, some of the stuff that I reference uh, may have appeared in my previous books, uh, but, but I'll focus mostly on this, this most recent book that came out. And so I'll tell you, uh, so that we can get to know each other, the reasons why I wrote this most recent book. Uh, there are several reasons. The first. Uh, that I should mention is, is in part because I wanted to convey a spirit. I wanted to convey a spirit. When I was finishing this book, a teenager of 18 years old was shot dead by a police officer in Ferguson, Missouri. And my students were some of the first in the streets to protest what they perceived as police repression and, 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 and oppression. I was there, and I write about this in the book. I was in front of the Ferguson Police Department on the night that the St. Louis County prosecuting attorney uh, announced that he would not be indicting the police officer who shot Michael Brown. And I heard the shrieks of Mike Brown's mom who was standing on a car. I didn't know it was her at the time, but all I could hear was the shriek, and all I could feel is my spine tingle from listening to a mama shriek, and other mamas cry, and young people hollering, the whole damn system is guilty as hell. And then I felt the heat from the burning cars, and I went to do an interview with uh, Chris Hayes on MSNBC. I had to shut that interview down quick because my car was about to burn up across the street, so I had to leave. Sorry, Chris Hayes. But I had never been in anything like that in my life. Earlier in the year, and Makiba knows this, earlier in the year, many of us were in the street and we tried to outrun armored personnel vehicles. And we saw the, the AR-15s and the riot shotguns. And 
We came home with the taste of tear gas in our mouths. This was the spirit that I was feeling as I was completing this book. And I had to convey that. Now, I'm not telling you this story like I was some kind of hero, like I was, I was uh, fighting the power and wrestling the police out in uh, the street. That was not me. But you know, who was steady in the police space, steady ensuring that we could operationalize our constitutional rights were these young people. And I feel obligation to share that spirit in this book to share the spirit of, of, of the people like Al Calloway, who 50 years ago took it upon themselves to raise their voice when they smelled, when they had a hint, when they heard of racial oppression going on either here in the United States or abroad. When, if they saw that a war was taking advantage, that American, American participation in a war was taking advantage, vulnerable people, they raised their voice. I wanted that spirit. That was the first mission for this particular book. The second mission was I was trying to follow the instructions of my elder, my hero, my fraternity brother, John Ho Franklin, who said that, that, that every generation has to write its own history. I believe that. I believe that. And so I'm doing what, it, what, he, what he told me to do in writing this book. And so what I tried to do with the book is I tried to write a nuanced history of black people, a nuanced history of black people. Now, there are a lot of good histories out today, and, and, and I'm so glad with the evolution of history. But one of the things that, that kind of irks some of us is the one-dimensional way that we see black people portrayed on television and on the big screen. You see, if you didn't know better, you would have thought in an earlier period that all black people were poor, downtrodden, and oppressed. Now, I'm not saying that all black people were, were not poor, downtrodden, or oppressed. Many were. But there were others. Think about it this way. When I say civil rights, the first thing that comes to your mind is, is uh, sharecroppers and, uh, and uh, uh, lynch mobs and things like this. But if I told you by 1965, more black people lived in the urban north and west than lived in the rural south, would that tell you something about the oppression that black people were facing and the changing oppressions that black people were facing? And so I wanted to write something nuanced. I wanted to know what, how did, if at all, black people who had a certain amount of privilege, that is black people who could attend at a university, how did they confront racism? And what did they have to risk? And so I set upon, set upon asking that question and writing that story. And what I found was something beautiful. Something beautiful. What I found is that black people struggled resisted and rebelled wherever they were. That includes ivy-laden universities. When we think of black power, some of us, some of us think of uh, Black Panthers in Oakland or, or in Chicago, and we think of leather jackets and berets and rifles, which is a tough way to think about the Black Panthers. We don't think about the health clinics that they had. We don't think about the breakfast programs that they had or the educational programs that they ran. We don't think about that. We don't think about the block voting that this brother has a voting t-shirt. We don't think about the block voting that they incorporated into their program. But we do remember the rifles and the, the leather jackets and the berets. It's harder for us to think of black power being in Yale University. It's harder for us to think of these students bringing a new discipline into universities that existed before the United States existed. That new discipline, of course, being black studies. And thank goodness they did, because I got a job for it, Jack. Thank you. <laughs> but this is my point. I write about students, faculty, and administrators at eight of the nation's most exclusive institutions of higher education and how they use 
what I call their black student power. That is their status as students in these exclusive places to advance the black freedom movement. Now this to me is very, very important and it's wildly confusing to me. Wildly confusing to me because they could have very well attained their education at these well-stayed and, and, and prestigious institutions and went on and got a wonderful job and lived middle or upper class life and been perfectly fine with their own families and been perfectly fine. But they didn't. This is what I couldn't understand when I first started researching. What would make them sacrifice their middle class and upper middle class and upper class success? And what I found was a spirit of uh, some of the people call it we, we Usi. Some of you know what this is, some of you don't know what this is. We Usi, we us I. They had a, a sense of collective identity. And, and it's true. When you talk to people like Al Callaway, they say, you remember when we shut that war down in Vietnam? You remember when we faced down the Ku Klux Klan? They say we. You don't hear them say I. They say we. Now, some of this goes off the rails because everybody marched with Martin King. I don't know how everybody, I don't know. But it's that spirit of collective struggle that pushed them. And I had to learn this while writing. And I didn't quite understand it until we were on the streets of Ferguson. Until I had that electric sense. Until I, I understood that this may very well be it for us. What would make my students sacrifice their scholarships. What would make those students 50 years ago do the same? And it was that collective sense of struggle. And when they did it 50 years ago, it was so much different than it is now. Like, think about it this way. There was a, something happening abroad in Southeast Asia. There was a war going on. They called for a, a U.S. draft. Now, one of the ways that you could avoid the draft is a student deferment. Now, if you're kicked out of school, expelled from school, you are now eligible for the draft. Many of these young people protested in spite of that. Now, not all these students, but some of these students were first generation college students. Now, I don't know if anybody's a first generation college student in here. I am. I got in trouble in school one time. This is out at Gonzaga University. And my parents who hadn't gone to school, and my brothers who were wonderful men who hadn't graduated from high school, they told me, we didn't send you up to that school to get in no trouble. So who are these young people that were brave enough to face down their parents? Who dog to face down their parents, to face down racism, to face down imperialism. Who were these students to ask for, let me rephrase, to demand black studies, the idea that black people are worthy of study, not just around the slavery time, not just around the, uh, the uh, singing spirituals time, but at all times. Who are these young people who, who fought to get black spaces like this at Dartmouth College? Dartmouth College, which was actually the first of the Ivy League institutions to graduate a black student in 1828. At Dartmouth College, students fought and won the approval of a building that they called the El Haj Malik El Shabazz Center, otherwise known as the Malcolm X Center. Now, anybody know where Dartmouth College is? It's in Hanover, New Hampshire. Now, I've happened to look at the census records. It happens to be one of the whitest cities in one of the whitest states in the entire union. 
What on earth is an El Haj Malik El Shabai Center doing up there? It took black students to do this. And they demanded it and they got it. So black spaces like that and like this. I'll tell you a story about it all in a little while. Black students pushed black students under the tutelage of people like Brother Calloway at Columbia University and at, at, at the University of Pennsylvania in West Philadelphia, Columbia University, right next to Harlem, to push against their institution's uh, expansion into black neighborhoods. They took over campus buildings and said, you won't expand any further. At Columbia University, <laughs> they called on people like Stokely Carmichael and, and H. Rap Brown. Now, I love these brothers. I love them for their militancy. I love them for their, their, their consciousness and all that sort of thing. But you know what I love them for the most? They were tall and skinny. <laughs> That's what I love them for the most. But they brought the funk every time, every time. And so students worked with community members to have the neighborhoods respected. Back then, the universities were working in conjunction with the federal, state, and, and municipal governments as part of what they call urban renewal. Today they call it, uh, what, gentrification? What they call it? I heard there's some of that going on. Yes. Mm, even here in Lauderdale. Even here in this neighborhood. Look, I, I'm trying to get invited back. I'm trying to get invited back. <laughs> Have me lose somebody's job. So these are the young people, along with their mentors, along with their allies in the community, that I wrote about, and I was I was excited at every moment uh, that I was writing, and it was an important thing for me to be able to do this. And so tonight, because of where we are, because of these exhibits that that, that, that we see. I wanted to talk just a brief second about the role of the Divine Nine in, in, in the Ivy League and, and uh, what they were able to do once they got out of the Ivy League. When I say Divine Nine, I mean the, the nine uh, black Greek letter organizations. We don't call ourselves Greeks anymore. We don't do that. We call ourselves brothers and sisters in Greek letter organizations. We're not Greek, we're African. So, so, so we're part of an organization, we get it. I'm part of the first and leading brotherhood. But there are other great organizations that you see all around. But I'll tell you a little bit about these organizations and, 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 and what role they played in the Ivy League institutions. And I'll start at Cornell. Um, I'll start at Cornell. Cornell was an interesting institution. It's the, the youngest of all the Ivy League institutions, Cornell University. Uh, it, it started in 1865, just at the close of the Civil War. The other institutions started before, as I mentioned before, before there was the United States, before there was a Constitution and that sort of thing. Cornell started with the idea that men and women could go to school together. That didn't happen in other Ivy League institutions until uh, 1969, 1970, uh, 72, 73. Uh, Columbia didn't didn't become co-educational until the 1980s. And so Cornell was unique that way. The idea with Cornell early on in the 1860s, going into the early 1900s, was that uh, any student should be able to study any subject they, wanna, they, 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 they want. And so uh, women were invited to, to attend, and black women did attend Cornell University. There was a rule on campus that women had to stay on campus. Men stay off campus, women stay on campus, ladies stay on campus. It was a very kind of paternalistic thing like, that they, they put together. But for some reason, white women were upset that they had to live with black women and all of a sudden, an unofficial ban occurred where black women couldn't stay on campus. Here is where we see uh, what scholars today call this uh, intersectionality, how this intersectionality works. This idea that, that black women can never be the same kind of women as white women. And yet black women will still be uh, uh, victims of this kind of uh, patriarchy and 
paternalism. Well, black women were suffering in that way. This housing piece was no small piece. I'll continue with Cornell, but I'll just tell you a quick story about Harvard University. When faced with the opportunity, this is in 19, around 1920, when faced with the prospect of black students living in the dormitory with uh, white students, one Mississippi, one Harvard alumnus from Mississippi said, I can see one day where black men and white men may eat under the same roof, separated of course, eat under the same roof, but, and I'm quoting, to sleep with a nigger is a horse of another color. You mean Fair Harvard? You mean 1636 Harvard? John F. Kennedy Harvard? This was the sense. And so at Cornell University, black men had the opportunity to attend but not participate in social activities. See, this is the difference. Ooh, when I told you about nuance, this is the kind of thing I was trying to get to. This is the difference between desegregation and integration. Desegregation is you're fine to come if you want to come, if you can make it, you can come. Integration, that's a whole different thing. So what they let you in? There's something more to life than just being in. And so to protect themselves, to make themselves feel normal, they band together. And at Cornell University, young men who were working in white fraternity houses, they thought we should join fraternities. Of course the white fraternities wouldn't let them join. Now, to some people that would mean they needed to go home and get under the, the comforters and cry. But to other people, that means you create your own. And that's what those young men at Cornell University did. They created Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. <clears throat> and in doing so, they, they made a way for the creation of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority at Howard University. And they made a way for Phi Nu Pi, uh, uh, Kappa Alpha Psi to, 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 to come about and the other fraternities and sororities. They used what had been used in our culture for centuries, fictive kinship. They relied on the elders and community. That's what they did. Now, they did it, and they were influenced by several things that was happening. I know it's cold in here, and it's only because there's an alpha in the atmosphere. <laughs> um, it is cold, though. I do realize that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but they were influenced by things going on. They were influenced by something called the Niagara Movement that was happening. They were influenced by the creation of a black fraternity in the United States called Sigma Pi Phi, otherwise known as the Boule. This was a group of uh, medical doctors and dentists who, who uh, got together to, to, to fraternize and to do on behalf of the community. Henry Arthur Callis, his picture is up over there. Uh, he was a founder of Alpha Phi Alpha and he married Cornell student Alice Dunbar Nelson. Now her name Dunbar was Dunbar because she had been previously married to Paul Lawrence Dunbar. And uh, and so the founder of Alpha Phi Alpha, Henry Callis, uh, married Alice Dunbar Nelson, who was uh, a good member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. She helped, I might have it wrong, but I think she helped to write the hymn for Delta Sigma Theta. And so uh, Dunbar Nelson, when we talk about the Harlem Renaissance, wrote her way through the Harlem Re Renaissance. Callis was a medical man, but he believed in black history and culture and was one of the early members of Carter G. Woodson, a Harvard, Harvard alumnus by way of PhD, a member of Carter G. Woodson's organization, the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. Am I boring you yet? I'm sorry if I am. They gave me a microphone and I'm not giving it back. <laughs> 
But like I said, he married Aunt Alice Dunmar Nelson, who helped to write that Delta hymn that we seem to hear at almost every black wedding in America. Look, how many times have you done heard the Delta hymn? I'm sorry. Uh, I love the Deltas a lot. They're good. Uh, out at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island, black educators were being groomed, groomed to lead HBCUs. Uh, John Hope attended Brown University and went down to become president, of course, of Morehouse College. Um, also attending Brown University's Women's College, which is now known as, uh, well, which eventually became known as Pembroke College, uh, a woman by the name of Ethel Robinson. Uh, she, she, she graduated Brown and went on to become a professor at, at Howard University. She was one of the early advisors of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. She took her education from Brown University. Another good, uh, good member of a black Greek letter organization, uh, um, a member of Alpha Phi Alpha, Frederick Fritz Pollard. You'll remember him as being a, an all-American football player, one of the first black professional football players uh, majored in chemistry. I think this is important to know. I always tell people this, because we think of football players a certain kind of way. Eh, he majored in chemistry while messing around. Since we're talking about football, maybe I should mention, maybe I should mention another uh, good alpha man uh, who was actually denied the opportunity to attend an Ivy League institution for his undergraduate degree. I'm speaking about a man who grew up in Princeton, New Jersey, the only American Renaissance man to have ever lived man by the name of Paul Robeson. Paul Robeson, of course, wanted to attend Princeton University because it was around the corner from his house. His brother had made application. Woodrow Wilson denied the application. Woodrow Wilson, who happened to be president of Princeton at the time, denied the application, even though uh, uh, Paul Robeson's daddy was, was one of the main black ministers in the, in the town. That wasn't enough. Paul Robeson never forgot that. So he went to Rutgers University, where of course he graduated valedictorian of his class. And I forgot to tell you, it was also a Walter Camp, all-American football player. He left Rutgers, went across the river to Columbia University to get his law degree. And while doing that, he was playing professional football. Oh, and while doing that, he was acting on Broadway. And while doing that, he was freedom fighting. But he wasn't good enough to go to Princeton University, which didn't admit black students until World War II. And then I'll tell you about another football player, a man by the name of Jerome Brood Holland, who uh, attended Cornell University. He was a good member of Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated. He, uh, on campus, among some white people, he was treated in a way that might have been better than most black students. Some athletes sometimes get treated better than, than other people. But he was always reminded of his race at one point or another. Well, he ended up graduating, going on to, to the University of Pennsylvania, and eventually became president of Delaware State, an HBCU, and eventually Hampton University, before being appointed to uh, Richard Nixon's administration. I don't know what happened along the way, but that's how that works. <laughs> du Bois, <clears throat> W.B. Du Bois, a good member of Alpha Phi Alpha. Uh, first black person to receive a PhD from Harvard University. Um, he said that he was at, but not of Harvard. I hope you caught it. At, but not of Harvard. He remembered being isolated. He remembered being isolated. He was uh, followed by Phi Beta Sigma, uh, Phi Beta Sigma member Alan Locke. You remember Alan Locke as the person who kind of coined the term Harlem Renaissance. Okay, Alan Locke got his undergraduate degree there, and then went back and got his doctorate from Harvard as well. Uh, he coined this, this term, 
Uh, he emphasized Harlem Renaissance, but coined the term New Negro, the New Negro. Jay Saunders Redding, I wanted to tell you a little bit about him. He wasn't a member of the Divine Nine, he was a member of uh, the Boulé, Sigma Pi Phi. Jay Saunders Redding, the, the, the literary giant. He remembered life in the Ivy League being miserable. He told a, a, a story about his experience. I'm gonna, if I have enough time, uh, just read a little bit about his experience. Just real quick, just real quick. When he got to Brown University, there were four black students, two graduated, leaving two black students for him, uh, he and another student. Uh, they tried their best not to be seen together on campus. They didn't want to make it seem as though they only cared to hang out with black people together. Do you see how this racism can mess up your mind? So they would meet behind closed doors and draw the, the curtains so nobody would see that they were meeting together. It drove them crazy. He said we were lost. This other black student said that there's something wrong with this. He said, there's, uh, he wondered out loud. He said there must be some place better than this. God damn it, there must be. Declaring his desire to leave, the student shared his feelings. He said, I feel like everybody's staring at me, all these white guys waiting for me to make a bad break. The student was suffering from what we today call racial battle fatigue. That student ended up committing suicide. I write about these people in a chapter called Surviving Solitude. Surviving Solitude. And that's precisely what these students did, is they made it in such a way, they made it through in such a way that they didn't get to participate in everything, but they excelled in spite of it all. They were every bit of your Rhodes Scholars, every bit of your Phi Beta Kappa. People like Charles Hamilton Houston was head of the Law Review. Charles Hamilton Houston, of course, you know the one who mentored Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood Marshall goes on to be Thurgood Marshall. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. When um, many of these early students attended these Ivy League institutions, they didn't pu push back against the institutions while there. Instead, they got their degrees and they went on to uplift the black community. And so they graduated, so people like Raymond Pace Alexander and Sadie Alexander, people, people like Charles Hamilton Houston, who I mentioned, they go out and they, they, uh, they make good in their community and they do whatever they can. People like uh, Eugene Kinkle Jones. But times changed in the 1950s and 60s. The tenor changed. The approach to black freedom changed. The idea of institutional racism was something that people like Malcolm X and, and Stokely Carmichael at the time spoke about. Groups like the Revolutionary Action Movement came about in the mid and early 1960s where people believed that it's okay to defend ourselves, it's okay to love ourselves. That influenced these students in the 1960s, the students that I spend most of my time writing about. At Columbia University in New York City, the son of famed psychologists. Let me see if you, let me see who we are tonight. Kenneth and Mamie Clark. Has anybody ever heard of Kenneth and Mamie Clark? You'll remember them probably most for the doll test in Brown versus the Board of Education. That's right, that's right. And their boy, Hilton Clark went to Columbia University. Hilton Clark grew up in the civil rights tradition. Hilton Clark was supposed to be part of the black bourgeoisie. Hilton Clark started an organization at Columbia University called the Students Afro-American Society. And the reason he started it, he said, was because students sometimes forget that they're part of a larger black project that they belonged to the larger black community, that they were supposed to act 
on behalf of the black community with the resources and talents that they have. And he started the Students Afro-American Society. That very same Students Afro-American Society kept the university from building a gymnasium in Morningside Park, a park that was used by black Harlem residents. Now, I don't know if you've been to New York City, particularly Manhattan, but it's not a whole heap of green space in New York City. And so the park meant something to people. Now, I'm not telling you it's a, it was a, a wonderfully safe park. People got mugged in the park because there were, there were people addicted to heroin. Uh, what do the people call it, Her how do you say heroin? <laughs> we say heroin, I don't know what you say. <laughs> Gil Scott. Gil Scott, right, Gil Scott, heroin. People understood that the university you was ready to use a public space for private purposes. And they pushed against it. Now, that's a story that doesn't often end well. Think about it this way, when Walmart wants to build a store somewhere, who can stop Walmart? Black students allied with white students, allied with, with community members, the West Harlem Community Organization and, and the Harlem Corps and, and all of these people including Al Calloway, the Revolutionary Action Movement, they pushed against the university, causing the university to keep from building what they called Jim Crow. You all don't get it. Get it, G-Y-M Crow? Nobody, come on. <laughs> this was the spirit of the new students. In 1968-1969, Stokely Carmichael said, students, thankfully, have gained a black consciousness and have stopped being the best representatives of middle-class white America. He said that students would be in the vanguard of the revolution and that it would be their job to fight racism. And they took heed. I'm gonna close with just a couple different vignettes from, from various institutions that I haven't yet got the chance to mention. At Harvard University, black students, black students got black studies the hard way. They, they had to protest for it. Now, I want you to think about things in these terms. The things that black students gain, that is, higher black admission and black studies, they didn't get these things because liberal white administrators thought it was a good idea. They got these things because of the pressure that black students put on, on these administrations. And they were able to get a black studies program. It wasn't the first one. But what was unique about the Harvard black studies program is that students could be part of hiring committees and tenure committees. Now, I used to think this was the freshest idea ever. I thought that was lit when I first started studying this. And then I became a professor. <laughs> And I was like, what do you mean a student, kid? <laughs> but this was the push. They were able to do it the hard way. Students at Yale University, as I mentioned to you, egghead students, spent an extra year trying to put together the Ivy League's first black studies program. Armstead Robinson, who was an historian who, who created black studies programs all over the United States participated in that effort. At Princeton University, the last university in the Ivy League to let black students in, black students not only protested for, 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 for various things like black studies program, but they protested against the university's investment in apartheid Southern Africa. Now I mention this because students were aware that the oppression that black people felt in the United States was not singular that the oppression they felt was part of a wider, wider <clears throat> project of colonialism. And they got the university to the best of millions of dollars of investment in apartheid Southern Africa by taking over the New South building. Woodrow Wilson was turning over in his grave. 
at Dartmouth College. Dartmouth College is in New Hampshire, as I mentioned to you. They tried a whole bunch of different things to get black students to come out there, including recruiting directly from a youth organization, I think it was on the west side of Chicago. Um, some of you might know it. It's called the Conservative Vice Lords. And so the Vice Lords came to Dartmouth College where they participated in a program where they remediated on some of their skills for, for, for two years and then uh, they were able to, to uh, be admitted to Dartmouth College. It was a, a white fellow who was part of SNCC. David Dolly was his name. And he had, he had uh, been following around the, the youth organization, the youth nation as they used to call them. Today people call them gangs. <laughs> <laughs> what can you do? What can you do? But this white fellow was like, these young men are very intelligent. And they're, they're, they're very quick. And I bet if they had the right resources, they'd be as smart as the, the people I went to school with at Dartmouth College. Now, good for David Dolly, and I respect him and his service to, to humankind. But don't we all know that? <laughs> that if black students are given the proper resources and opportunities, that they will respond as well as anybody else, if not better. But good for him, and he started, helped to start this program. So I mentioned that. Dartmouth College, was, it was so funny. Like they, they had such troubles getting black men to stay at Dartmouth College, in part because there was nobody for them to date. Think about it that way, like we don't think about these things. This is what I was saying about nuance. Like now some didn't mind dating who was the, the, the people who were in the town who happened not to be black whenever they could. But to, as a Dartmouth College student, you couldn't have a car to your junior year on campus. And so some of the trustees came up with the idea of, you know what we should do? We should we should start a secretarial program here in Hanover, and they talked to the business leaders. We're gonna start a secretarial program, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna have black women come and train in the program, and in the minds of these patriarchal dudes, they were like, and then these women will avail themselves to these black students, and then the black students will stay. Do you see how this stuff got your mind all messed up? Instead of just saying, why don't we just invite women to go to school at Dartmouth College and black women to go to school at Dartmouth College? It eventually happened. I wanted to mention Dartmouth College for that reason. At Brown University, here again mentioning women, the women of Pembroke College decided that Brown University wasn't moving quickly enough in admitting black women. And so, they decided to lead a walkout. When preparing to lead the walkout, they walked past the black men of the uh, Afro-American society, and they said, uh, we're about to walk out until the university, we're gonna boycott this university until uh, they decide black people are important enough to admit. You're welcome to come with us. And thank goodness these brothers were smart enough to do what we should all do and follow black women off campus. I'm pandering. I'm pandering. <laughs> but they led a boycott, a black boycott of Brown University and Pembroke College. And do you know it worked? They got $2.1 million to be uh, directed towards the recruitment of black students at Brown University and Pembroke College. Now, you all know that that's, that's no money for an Ivy League institution. But here's my challenge. What's the university down here? Uh, what, what's the university? Uh, which one is it? Is it U.S.? Yeah. Florida Memorial? Yeah, yeah, Florida Memorial. Uh, or, or whichever university down here. I dare you to try to get $2.1 million that would go towards black recruitment. Today, I dare you to try it. 
black men all of a sudden got strong and they refused to end their boycott until they said a proper commitment was made. And that was until the university agreed on a number for, uh, for recruitment. That was Brown University. At the University of Pennsylvania, I told you about the idea that these students pushed against the university's expansion in West Philadelphia. There used to be a neighborhood in West Philadelphia. Anybody from Philly? There used to be a neighborhood. Hey, now, there used to be a, a neighborhood called Mantua that no longer exists. Today, they call it University City. Students pushed against this, white students and black students alike, along with uh, community members. What resulted was the university's agreement to put $10 million towards the creation of low-income housing. Again, this is small money when we're talking about things, but I don't know if you'll find a university today to do it. What am I leaving out? Uh, at, at, I told you about Columbia, let's see. What am I leaving out? Am I leaving out RBL, Princeton? Yeah. At Yale, we talked about Armstead Robinson. Let me tell you finally about Cornell University, and this is probably the university that comes to your mind when you think about the Ivy League and black student protest. Because in 1969, Time Magazine featured an article with Eric Evans and uh, Ed Whitfield walking out of Willard Strait Hall holding a rifle and one of them having bandoliers of bullets across their chest. People in America said this black militancy thing had gone too far. Students up there with guns, with firearms. Hey, let me tell you something, Jack. Let me tell you something. Anybody ever been to Cornell? Been to Cornell? Tell me it's not up there in the country. <laughs> Cornell is up in the country and people regularly hunted and students always had firearms. But nobody thought having firearms on campus was a problem until, hmm, black students shouldered firearms. And the one thing we never do in America is allow black people to be afraid. We didn't allow Trayvon Martin to be afraid. Some people didn't catch it. They said, well, some people in America said, well, he beat up on that, uh, on that wannabe police officer. He didn't get a chance to be afraid. Let me tell you something about the Cornell students. You see, remember when I told you about the housing piece at Cornell, when black women couldn't stay in the dormitory? Well, black women finally got a chance to stay in the dormitory. And one of the things that happened to black women was the white women who stayed with them started complaining because of the smell of black women's hair products. And black women steadily had to, to, to keep white women's hands out of their hair. <laughs> and, 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 and some of this stuff comes from silliness, the silliness of segregation in America. Some white people wanted to watch black women wash their hair. And so black women said, this is enough. Like, we're gonna get our own house and we're gonna stay there. They called it the Wari House. The Wari Cooperative House. And so they stayed at the, at the Wari House. Well, a cross was burned on the lawn of the Wari House. Now, I don't know where you come from. I come from the Northwest, where there is a real thing, such as white supremacists, and skinheads, and things like that. So when a cross is burned on the lawn, that's a message to somebody. Black men, possibly souped up on hyper-masculine behavior, said that we won't allow this to happen to our, our black women. And so they, they took students and they took over the student union building. When they did, when they did, this caused a stir on campus, you can imagine, <clears throat> white fraternity members, White fraternity member said, this is not right that those black students took over this student union building. I forgot to tell you, it happened to be parents weekend when they did it. <laughs> My bad. The student union, went, uh, student union also went as a, a hotel, and so parents were staying in the student union building. Black students 
pounded on all the doors and said, there's a fire, there's a fire. And all the, all the parents were coming out, mostly white parents, all white parents, came out and they turned on the fire hose and sprayed the poor parents. You can imagine they were upset. And they got everybody out of the building. There was no fire. There was no fire. When black students took over that building, they, they took it over, locked it. White students, as part of a fraternity, broke into the building saying, we're taking a, uh, uh, our building back. We're making Cornell great again. <laughs> well, those black students issued the white students a two-piece and a biscuit. In the vernacular of the corners, they upscuffed the boogie on those white students. Now, some of you have been in these kind of kerfuffles. And when you run into these kinds of fisticuffs, sometimes people say threatening language when they leave, like, I'm going to kill you. Or rape, this is where you will die. Now, sometimes we know that that's just talk. And maybe it would have been just talk had not a cross just burned on the lawn. Maybe it would have been just talk if not, if not for students feeling phone calls in the student union with death threats. Black students had rifles and spears and knives sneaked into the building where they felt they needed to protect themselves. They were protesting originally for an Africana Studies and Research Center to be run by James Turner, who was a, a graduate student from Northwestern University that showed up at the Howard University protest where Howard University was protesting for a black studies program. <laughs> and they chose him to be the director of this student, uh, of this Africana Studies and Research Center. The university was moving slow on it. They protested. And then when the cross burned, they wanted better security for black students on campus. The university acceded to their demands. And they won. Those students risked everything. They risked their chance at middle class and upper middle class and upper class success. Had things gone wrong and the police come in, they risked their lives. Now, I write about largely the, the students who would protest, who would push back. But the grand, you know, as in most cases, most people didn't push back too hard or protest. In a history, we have a thing where we love to write about the troublemakers and things like that. But the truth is, the people who mostly make history are people who survive. And these young people, along with their mentors and their community allies, these young people were pioneers. They were <coughs> soldiers. <coughs> when all they really wanted to be was students and employed. And I'm thankful for what they did. And I'm thankful that you all listened. Thank you.